Uh, we're going to look at uh, this passage. So if you have your, uh, open your Bibles to Luke 4, verses 16 to 30. And this is where Jesus visits uh, the synagogue in his hometown of Nazareth. And uh, things don't go so well there. <laughs> it ends on a pretty ominous note. And uh, so we want to... Uh, I want you to look at that for uh, a little while and read through that. And uh, here's uh, specifically what I'd like for you to do with Luke 4. Uh, well, first, let me all remind you, on um, page 58, you have uh, six principles for reading uh, the Gospels for spiritual formation. And this will be helpful to think about these uh, as you read through this passage and as you move towards uh, interpreting it and applying it. Okay, so you just want to kind of be mindful of these principles and uh, they will kind of help you know what to focus on, what to emphasize, and uh, what not to do. That's on page 58. Six principles for reading the Gospels for spiritual formation. But what strikes you about uh, the context uh, building up to Luke 4 verses 16 to 30? What, what do you see in these first three chapters three and a half chapters that sets the context. Anything that particularly jumps out at you? Yeah, Tyler. It just seems to be like one herald after another of like an affirmation that this is the, the, the fulfilled prophecy. It's kind of like, it's like one herald, again, yeah, so repetitive heralding. Repetitive heralding, meaning uh, announcing uh, that, uh, okay, yeah. You have a lot of appeals to you on the boundaries in chapter one and chapter three. Right. Kind of big portion of that, and then I don't think the Pharisees could really argue right. politically against John the Baptist. Right. John the Baptist is a big deal, isn't he? And he's not in our systems, by and large, for whatever reason, but in the Gospels, John the Baptist is a huge deal. And John the Baptist gets almost as much ink in the first two chapters as Jesus does, doesn't he, in terms of his birth and his parents. Uh, Zacharias and Elizabeth are focused on really in, in more than Joseph and Mary in those first two chapters. So it's kind of, kind of interesting, isn't it? Yeah. I'd say that uh, Luke is um, showing kind of John preparing the way for Jesus' ministry and then contrasting Jesus with John showing Jesus' superiority. All right, great point. Absolutely. And John said that he was superior, and so Jesus, it, it's not a competitive thing. He's simply announcing that and moving into that role, isn't he? Okay. Good. Anything else in those first four chapters that... Well, just not to neglect Simeon and Anna as well. Right. Both made similar proclamations. You know, okay. Of, All right. This is the man. All right. Good point. Yeah, the Simeon and then Anna and the temple, recognizing that. Well, these are... Uh, this is one of the things that I noticed uh, in these first four chapters that's particularly relevant to, uh, you know, our passage, Luke 4, 16 to 30, and that is that Luke has four unique uh, passages about folks being filled with the Spirit or the Spirit being on them in Simeon's case, that the other Gospels, the other three Gospels, do not have these. So Luke uh, has a, a, a great interest in recording the working of the Holy Spirit, and you would expect that because then in Acts, when the Spirit is poured out on the church, we, we need this background, don't we? We need this uh, a theological foundation. And uh, what's interesting about these four, well, uh, John the Baptist is filled with the Spirit while in his mother's room, womb. So, all right, a newly uh, conceived uh, infant there in the womb. And uh, his father, or Elizabeth, uh, his mother, should say, upon seeing Mary, who is pregnant with Messiah, with Jesus, uh, she is filled with the Spirit, and she has this wonderful... Uh, you know, prophetic, uh, joyful uh, saying in Luke 1, 41 following. And then Zacharias, who was struck mute <laughs> uh, by Gabriel the angel in uh, the uh, holy place when he was doing the incense because he didn't believe what the angel told him about having a son, 
John the Baptist. He can finally speak, and when he does, he's filled with the Spirit, and he has this wonderful uh, uh, prophetic thing that he says. And then uh, the fourth one uh, is Simeon in the temple, and he, the Spirit is upon him, and uh, he has this amazing uh, uh, statement, prophetic statement, about uh, uh, Jesus. Again, infant Messiah here. So you look at those four unique things in Luke's Gospel, and you got to say, gee, I wonder why those are, are there. I wonder what the emphasis is from that. What, what would you say? What's just kind of your initial instinct as to why? And, and I think, Tyler, that's what you were talking about, the heralding or that, is that what you were, that sort of thing in these early chapters, okay? And it's all centered around the, the ministry of the Holy Spirit, isn't it? The empowering ministry of the Spirit. So what do you think the significance of that is then? Yeah. Okay, well, so for Luke, Luke was a Gentile, right? Yes. So, um, and, you know, he does stress the Holy Spirit um, in, in, in Acts. As right. Well. And, and the Holy Spirit, the presence of the Holy Spirit upon somebody's life is a mark of their being included in the, the, this new kingdom. Right. And so right. For a Gentile like Luke, that would be yeah. a significant thing, I think. That's, All right. And which also plays into. It's that mark that shows that, the, as you saw in Acts, right. is that what, what showed that the gospel was to go outside of the borders of just the sociopolitical. Um, All right, Israel. great point, great point. Who got the Holy Spirit? Yeah, Jonathan, jump in. I was just going to say, is there something about the concentration of all of this happening as in relation to like the Old Testament, very sparse? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Great point. Suddenly, a vivid contrast. Because who who got the Spirit in the Old Testament? Okay, so what office is he in? Okay. King. King. All right, king's got it. And, uh, the Spirit would come upon them to empower them to do that. And there's two other offices in particular that did that. Big three. Prophets. Prophets. Priests. Priest. Okay, prophet, priests, and kings. Uh, so this is, think about that. That's a very, 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 very small percentage of people throughout the history of Israel, right? Prophets, priests, and kings. Okay. Who else? Well, there's... The judges, remember Samson, Spirit, and all that. There's Moses and the 70 who helped uh, him uh, judge the people of Israel in, in the wilderness. And then there's one other group, a group of artistic folks. Well, I'm trying to think, didn't Saul join a group of prophets? He did. And, and what's interesting in the Old Testament with several of these folks, when the Spirit came upon him, they prophesied. And then Saul prophesied uh, with these prophets, and, and then in, in several cases said, but they, they didn't do it again. So it was, it was kind of an initial expression of the Spirit coming upon them, and, uh, and then it didn't continue, because that wasn't their task or that office necessarily. He was a king, not a, not a prophet, wasn't he? The, the last group are the artisans who were building the tabernacle. The Spirit came upon them and empowered them, especially, you know, their leader, others involved in that. So there's, there's seven groups, again, uh, of infinitesimally small uh, percentage of folks in the Old Testament that uh, the Scriptures say are, were empowered with the Spirit. And suddenly now, Jonathan, your point's very well taken. This is a stunning contrast, isn't it? Here we have John the Baptist, who's, who's in line with the prophets, okay. But then his mother and father... Okay, they're of the, the priestly line, but, uh, you know, they're, in, in, in a sense, reasonably, you know, just kind of normal average folks. Uh, and then Simeon. And so, yeah, this is just suddenly within, you know, two chapters, we've got uh, four, four people that are, the Spirit is coming upon them. So that, what does that indicate? Yeah. Is there a reason why you didn't put Jesus in the wilderness temptation after two? Like well, uh, it, it, it says filled with the Spirit. Yeah, uh, he, we haven't gotten there yet. Okay. Yeah, so we get, okay. yeah, in. Uh, I just thought of that list. That right, that in certainly, yeah. Be more to show, uh, since you're trying to show Jesus as Messiah, that you need to have sources that are Jesus. 
I, I'm sorry, say it again, Robert. Is it partially too because if you're trying to show Jesus in the sideship, you need to show sources that are basically not Jesus in this? Okay, yeah. Uh, and again, I think with the coming of the Messiah, it's going to be the age and the coming of the Spirit, isn't it? In, in new and ultimately uh, far more pervasive ways. You know, we're moving, heading towards Pentecost, where all God's children will be empowered with the Spirit. And, and we'll be able to speak forth. So that's what we're, we're moving toward. And so we're getting kind of a little foreshadowing, a little glimpse of that here, aren't we? And, and yes, you know, can your points well taken. Then Jesus in chapter four, verse one, says he is full of the Spirit. And he returned from the Jordan and was, uh, was led about by the Spirit in the wilderness. So uh, uh, he shares in that same uh, sort of, uh, you know, the work of the Spirit, uh, of course, in his life. It better be. He's the anointed one. All right, but that's, we've kind of jumped ahead a little bit. Uh, all of this, uh, what would you say it helps to uh, shape your expectations as a reader uh, for when Jesus is going to be baptized with the Spirit, or the Spirit's going to come upon him and anoint him, fill him? What would you expect the purpose of that to be? The purpose. What was the purpose? What happened to all four of these folks when the Spirit came upon them? They spoke, didn't they? They spoke. They prophesied. They spoke forth the mighty deeds of God, essentially. Okay? And, uh, and so you would then kind of think, well, perhaps when Jesus uh, is uh, anointed, baptized with the Spirit in chapter 3, that, uh, you know, there would be a similar sort of a thing. And so... It's a heavenly anointing. We have the voice from heaven. Thou art my beloved son whom I'm well pleased. This is Jesus' baptism. And if you're an Israelite sitting there and trying to make sense out of this, in light of the fact you know the Old Testament, I would suggest you would be drawn to a passage, uh, Luke 40, Isaiah 42, excuse me, 1 through 4, because this passage <coughs> is the intersection of two sets. It's about the anointing of the servant of the Lord, number one. But number two, it has the same uh, sort of language, very similar language to the voice from heaven. And so again, as an Israelite, you would know this passage well because it was a day that you longed for to see this happen, to see the anointed one come. So here we go, Isaiah 42. This is one of about six or seven passages in Isaiah announcing uh, the servant of the Lord and uh, the fact that he's going to be anointed with and empowered by the Spirit. Here we go. Isaiah 42, 1 through 4. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul delights. Sounds like the voice from heaven, doesn't it? Although there he specifically said my son. I have put my spirit upon him and he will bring forth justice to the nations, to the peoples plural, not just to the nation of Israel, but to the nations. Verse 2, he will not cry out or raise his voice or make his voice heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and a dimly burning wick he will not extinguish. Interesting language about the one anointed with the Spirit, isn't it? Perhaps picturing his death, burial, and resurrection. Verse 3, uh, uh, verse 4 then, uh, well, verse 3, a bruised reed he will not break, and a dimly burning wick he will not extinguish. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not be disheartened or crushed until he has established justice in the earth, and the coastlands or the islands, the far, far, far away places, will wait expectantly for his law. So if that's what is going on at the baptism of Jesus then, his baptism or anointing with the Spirit, I would suggest, it is in line with the four that have occurred, isn't it? It is to uh, announce, to speak, to proclaim, to herald good news, and in this case, uh, internationally, universally. <laughs> Not just to the nation, but to the nations. Okay? Now why is uh, all this just significant in terms of context? How does that relate to Luke 4? 16 to 30. Got this little Holy Spirit theme going. 
How does that help explain Luke 4, 16 to 30? No, how do all these, these incidents, Jesus' baptism, uh, these other folks that uh, we see the work of the Spirit, they're empowered to speak, he apparently is empowered to speak. How does all that relate to, see we're building, Luke is building momentum, building uh, a thematic flow, isn't he? How does that relate to Luke 4, 16 to 30? He's giving evidence of his qualifications. Okay, all right. And so what is Luke 4, 16 to 30? What is it? How does that relate to all this Holy Spirit thing going on here? Claims that he is the Messiah. All right. He transitions from being heralded about to now he is now. All right. He he's claiming to be the Messiah, and he's giving a purpose statement uh, for the anointing with the Messiah as the Messiah, isn't he? And he's going to use another one of those passages in Isaiah. Probably the best known one, Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2. And he's doing it in his hometown. Part, and doing it in his hometown. Yes. Okay. So, all right, let's look at it. And when we get to the quote from Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, um, I, I, I want some of you... Uh, if you would look in Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, and you're going to see, there's a little bit of uh, kind of textual issues there, but he's going to leave out a very beloved <coughs> phrase <laughs> from Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, all right? He's going to leave it out. And uh, that's going to be a bit vexing to the troops in Nazareth, okay? And he came to Nazareth where he'd been brought up, and as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. Now, not all Jewish people, they weren't, it wasn't demanded or required that they go to the synagogue. So it was a bit of a choice. It's interesting. And he took uh, the book or the scroll of the prophet Isaiah and it was handed to him. And he opened the scroll, the book, and found the place where it was written. Now, in uh, the synagogue, we have found uh, uh, examples, copies of the liturgical calendar in Israel. And they followed a list of readings of... Uh, the, the law and the prophets. And so Jesus <laughs> probably timed it so that he would be there during the time they would, the prophet readings would be from Isaiah. Now Isaiah is one of the longer and you know, most beloved prophetic books, so it probably covered you know, a few, few weeks time. But he probably specifically wanted to be there so that they would hand him the Isaiah scroll. He didn't ask for it, but it was handed to him so he could do the reading. All right, uh, yes. How long would the readings be normally? Because it looks like he just read two verses. Yeah, they, they're not very long. They just, they would, you know, uh, I don't know, maybe, who knows, two or three minutes, four minutes. They probably had a little longer attention span to hear things read than we do. So did Jesus Oral culture. Rigid, deliberately work? Because I'm trying to figure out why they stopped and they were like staring at him. Like, yeah. Why he did something that was outside of... Yes, okay. He did something outside of the liturgical well, something. something's offensive. Let's see if we can figure out what it is. All right, now, some of you look at Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, see what we leave out. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are downtrodden, to proclaim the fable year of the Lord. Okay? Um, what did he leave out? What phrase? Yes. And the day of vengeance of our God. All right. That's the phrase he left out. Hey, that was one of their favorite phrases. <laughs> okay. Uh, now, you're a good uh, Jew, and you've clung to these passages in Isaiah about the coming of the Spirit Anointed One, that is, the coming of the Messiah. And this is perhaps the best known one, and Jesus chose it because it's in the first person, okay? Uh, and he leaves out a key phrase, so that would be enough to vex him, Tyler, you know, vex the troops there, that he would leave that out. And um, so y you know this, and, and you have, as a good Jew, and as a Jewish people, you have an interpretation of this passage, don't you? You know who the poor are, you know who the captives are, you know who the blind are, you know who the downtrodden are. Who are those? Israel. Yeah, for centuries, right? 
this point about six and a half centuries of little Judah being trampled by Gentiles. So you are the poor, the captives, the blind, the downtrodden. And so when Messiah comes, he's got good news for you, you know, the Jewish poor, captives, blind, and downtrodden. And he's going to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Now most understood that both within rabbinical Judaism and within uh, the Essenes, Qumran, and that. Uh, understood that as uh, an allusion to the year of Jubilee. Remember, every seven years they're supposed to have a sabbatical year for the land of life fallow, and every seven sevens, that is every the 50th year after the seven sevens, it was the year of Jubilee. And remember what happened on the year of Jubilee? It, several major things, but at least three big ones. What happened? Year of Jubilee. Land was returned to the original owners? Land was returned to original owners. So the rich don't get richer and the poor don't get poorer. Okay. What else? That would have been nice to have had that rule in effect during the Depression. Because <laughs> a lot of people lost their land and their property. So they couldn't even pay their taxes. So they lost it. So my family did. Great, great grandparents. Okay. Landers returned the original owners. What else? Slaves set free. Slaves set free. Were forgiven. Debts were forgiven. Wow. Everything's supposed to get kind of economically turned back right side up, isn't it? Isn't that wonderful, beautiful picture of God's concerns, uh, you know, for these sorts of issues. So when Messiah came, wow, it was going to be the Jubilee of Jubilees, isn't it? It's going to be, wow, the most ultimate, you know, the favorable year of the Lord, the, 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 the greatest Jubilee that ever occurred. And Israel's going to get, uh, she's going to get everything turned right, right side up. And... Isaiah 60, 61 pictures the Gentiles coming, streaming to Jerusalem with wealth in hand <laughs> to uh, uh, replenish not only the, the temple, but to replenish, uh, you know, Israel and her wealth. So, so wow, that's going to be a great time. So, verse 20, this great passage, wonderful, well-known passage. Jesus closed the book, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed upon him, and he said, began to say to them, Today, the scripture has been fulfilled in their hearing. What's he saying? I'm the Messiah. I'm the Messiah. And all were speaking well of him, wondering at the gracious words which were falling from his lips. And they were saying, Is this not Joseph's son? <laughs> And he said to them, no doubt you will quote this proverb to me, physician, heal yourself. Whatever we heard was done at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. Okay, so they want to see something if he's the Messiah. Uh, and he said to them, verse 24, truly I say to you, no prophet is welcome in his hometown. That's another proverbial sort of a saying, isn't it? All right, now Jesus is going to give two illustrations. The uh, first one's in verse 25. 26, and the second one's in verse 27. One's about the ministry of Elijah, one's about the ministry of Elisha. What's the significance of those? Yeah. Uh, so just take a quick step yeah. back to the, the, that phrase. Were they referring to a reputation that he had already had from Capernaum? Of, of, of yes. The sick? In that right. Tree, right. In the same section, it yeah. says that he settled in Capernaum. He did. He's left Nazareth and settled in Capernaum as his home base. And he's uh, sleeping on the couch at uh, Peter's in, in home, you know, with his wife and mother-in-law and up children and all that. So, yeah. So, but he's moved. Capernaum is his new headquarters. And yes, a lot of things happened there, but things are, Nazareth was kind of got left behind, didn't it? That's a catchy title for a book. Okay. Um, <laughs> All right, so what, what's the purpose of these two illustrations? What's the purpose? Yeah, ministering. Both of those prophets are ministering. I know what definitely Naaman is, but I'm yeah. not sure if the woman is as well. Yeah. Gentile, yeah. And then one's a leper and one's a widow. All right. Okay. Exactly, all right. You need to switch schools, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm teasing. We need luring him to Talbot here. <laughs> okay, um, Elijah and Elisha ministered to Gentiles, all right? What does Jesus have in common with them? Why use these two illustrations from the Old Testament? What do you think his purpose is? He's opening the kingdom to Gentiles. Okay, uh, as Messiah, he wants to 
uh, is, is intending to minister to Gentiles. And if Isaiah 42, 1 through 4 is in fact in view at his baptism, he received uh, the baptism of the Spirit with an international ministry in view, isn't it? To empower him to that. Okay, and so he's simply uh, unpacking that now in this sermon, isn't he? This little discussion. Now what else does he have in common with Elijah and Elisha? <coughs> Okay, they're prophets. The Spirit of God was upon them, empowered them. What did the Spirit empower them to do? To minister to Gentiles, in part. Not totally, but in part. Jesus is the Messiah. He's empowered with the Spirit. What's the Spirit empowering Him to do? Certainly to minister to uh, Israel, but also empowered Him to minister to Gentiles. The point being, this is not a new thing. This is in continuity with an old thing. This is in continuity with God's intentions from the very beginning, isn't it? Abraham, through you I will bless all the peoples of the world. And Elijah and Elisha were a, a means to express that, weren't they? To minister to peoples outside of Israel. Okay? So Jesus is saying this is not a new thing, for me as a Messiah, but it's an old thing. It's in continuity with that. Uh, but he, of course, then in ministering to Gentiles then, going back to our quote, what does that mean then about the reference of his ministry, the recipients of his ministry? <laughs> who are the poor, the captives, the blind, and the downtrodden who are going to receive ministry from Messiah? It includes the Gentiles, doesn't it? It includes the poor, the captives, the blind, the downtrodden, among all the peoples of the world, not to the exclusion of Israel, but including the peoples in his ministry as Messiah. Additionally, if they're going to be included in that, they're going to be included in <laughs> the proclamation of the favorable year of the Lord, aren't they? Ouch. Okay. Now, that's not to the exclusion of Israel, but I think what, what we see in the Gospels is that ministry uniquely to Israel is going to get moved, all of these things like that are going to get moved to his return, to his second coming. But in the first coming, it's going to be a, a, a universal ministry to Jews and to Gentiles, isn't it? So absent in his proclamation then is the day of vengeance of our Lord. He's not preaching vengeance upon the Gentiles, is he? Now, upon his return, different story. Different story. We'll get the fulfillment of that. But this is not the day of vengeance, is it? And we, as followers of Jesus, are not to wreak vengeance on others. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. So, you know, we're not to take our own vengeance uh, on these things, but hand that to the Lord, okay? Um, now, the troops didn't particularly like this, did they? <laughs> And all the synagogue were filled with rage as they heard these things, and they rose up and cast him out of the city and led him to the brow of the hill on which their city had been built in order to throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went his way. Wow, he just said, I'm the Messiah. They said, great, we're going to kill you. <laughs> wow, okay. So what's, what's this passage telling us? What's, the, what's it about? What's the, what's the thrust of it? Don't throw Messiah down a cliff, yeah, all right. Well, the kingdom of God is, is pervasive. It's moving outside of Israel and it's beginning to right. every person everywhere. All right, the kingdom uh, as uh, represented and announced here with the pouring out of the Spirit on these people, now Messiah, first and foremost, uh, is uh, to be a universal kingdom, isn't it? And so how is God's historic people going to respond to that? Well, if this is an indication, not too well, is it? Not too well. And in fact, this passage, most Lucan scholars, and I think <laughs> rightly so, I agree with them, this passage is Jesus' inaugural address in Luke's Gospel. And it sets a trajectory for Luke and for Acts, since they're two parts of the same work, aren't they? 
that the kingdom goes out to Israel and the peoples of the world, but God's historic people, Israel, will thwart and hinder that because it has delayed in, uh, their hopes and expectations of what Messiah would do for them. And, and, and in a sense, you can understand that, can't you? It's delayed that. And, and, and they may think it's, it's not only delayed it, but it may never happen. But no, essentially, it's delayed that until Messiah returns. And that's not good news for them, is it? Yeah, Tyler. Um, the, the Isaiah 61 reference also links this to the Abrahamic covenant, right? And that it says that this is, yeah. when it's describing in Isaiah 61, it makes reference to the fact that this is the Abrahamic covenant, how they will bless. I, I think so, yes. Uh, yeah, of course, the Abrahamic covenant, the fulfillment of that is the promised Holy Spirit, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. So, and so Acts makes a big deal out of how then not only Israel, those who believed the Messianic Jews got the Spirit in Acts 2, but then the Samaritans, when they believe in Messiah Jesus in Acts 8, they get the Spirit and, and our fellow proclaimers with the Messianic Jews, see? And then when the Gentiles in Acts 10 get the Spirit, <laughs> They are fellow proclaimers with Israel, aren't they? Empowered to herald. And then in Acts 19, when we loop back and, and get an interesting group of folks, some of John the Baptist's followers, who about 20 years later still haven't heard the Messiah come or the Spirit had been given, they get included. And so it kind of loops back historically and picks up some stragglers, so to speak. Um, so this is a big deal, isn't it? This passage, it's really important. And it tells us a lot about uh, Jesus' ministry and his intentions and, and also the purpose of the Holy Spirit's empowering, doesn't it? Now, let me share with you, I heard a really very, very famous pastor preach on this passage a while back. And uh, his point from the passage was, and his application was, Jesus got rejected by his hometown folks. And so if you grow in Christ and get excited about Christ, you well might be get rejected by your hometown folks. Okay, what do you think of that? Pardon? A, a lot of people say that. Yeah, it's popular. That's not, a, that's not a unique thing. No, no, it's widespread. Well, let's unpack that a moment yeah. before we then kind of maybe come up with a little different. What kind, what, what is that application doing to this narrative, this gospel passage? What is it doing to it? Pardon? It's kind of like allegorizing to a personal. Yeah, well, it's, it's looking at Jesus as an example, a, a model believer, isn't it? So I think it's a little, little different from allegorizing. But it's looking at him as a model believer. Is he a model believer? Yes, of course he is for us. Might we be rejected by our hometown folks? Yes, absolutely. But is the point of the passage to focus on a kind of a generic hometown folks? <laughs> no, these hometown folks represent Israel, aren't they? The other Jewish people. So they represent the, the nation of Israel and a, 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 what will turn out to be a typical response of the Jewish people. So yes, there is hometown folks, but th the emphasis is not on the hometownness, if you will. It's on the fact that they're, they're Jewish people. And, and again, you'd expect if anybody would be receptive, it would be his hometown folks, but, but no. This is the best case scenario, and it, it, it crashes and burns as, in terms of reception. When it yeah. comes to the you know, where they're like, oh, you might be rejected by your home and stuff. Isn't yeah. that like a significance you can draw in some sense? Because, you know, he does, the people do say, isn't this Joseph's son? Yeah. And then also when he uh, goes to Nathaniel, he's like, oh, what good yeah. comes from Nazareth? Yeah. So right. There's, there's that sense of like that familiarity that they knew about that. Sure. And certain expectations they already Sure. Have. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, obviously, it's not the main it's not the point of the passage. No, it's like. no. It's, it's, it, it, and and it, it really could happen, mightn't it? We might be rejected from those who know us best. And, and it happens many times, be it family or friends or whatever. So there's legitimacy to that. But it's kind of down the line in terms of importance, isn't it? 
And, and to elevate that as the primary application, which we tend to do when, when, when people speak on this passage, isn't it? Is, is to, to miss what is telling us about Jesus as the Messiah and his purpose, and specifically what it's telling us about the purpose of the Holy Spirit's empowering. Remember, this is the fifth example now of the Spirit fills or empowers and they speak. Boom, one, two, three, four. John the Baptist, Zacharias, Elizabeth, Simeon, and now it prepares the way for Messiah Jesus. Then you see that? Wonderful continuity. So it's a powerful passage about why has the Holy Spirit empowered us? Uh, uh, well, it's empowered us, and Luke's point is primarily to speak forth the mighty deeds of God. The, the same Spirit who was poured out on these others and then on Messiah, he promises is going to be poured out on Pentecost. And what do they do? The Spirit comes, he empowers them. What do they do? They speak forth the mighty deeds of God. The same with the Samaritans in chapter 8, the same with the Gentiles in chapter 10. You got the picture? This is a purpose of Holy Spirit baptism. So to just reduce it to, well, this is really about us, a good chance that we're going to get rejected by our hometown folks. See, that, that impoverishes it, doesn't it? And again, but we like to make it about us, don't we? And so we make Jesus a, a, a model believer, similar to us, and, and there's truth to that. He is a model. And then, then we reduce it to being about us. And so then we start thinking about, well, yeah, I think I've been rejected by such and such, or I may be rejected by them. And, and we shift the focus from Jesus to ourselves. Do you see that? And, and we miss, I think, the richness of the application that Luke would want us to draw. Yeah, Andrew? Um, just taking a few steps backwards, but how does verse 22 fit in with the passage that Jesus is giving you trouble? Because they seem to respond positively, and then all of a sudden he right. brings up so, so. Yeah. Um, well, I think they were giving him uh, the benefit of the doubt, because they knew him and, and had respect for him and appreciation for him. And what he was saying was, was pretty amazing, and he was saying it well, apparently. Uh, but I don't know that the whole truth and thrust of it had dawned on them yet as to exactly what he's saying. And then when he gave those two illustrations, I think it seemed to just crystallize for them. Oh, wow. Okay, you're the Messiah and you're not primarily about us, ministering to us. So I think there seemed to be a little trickle down and so Luke wants to bring that out to show the really sharp contrast between kind of the, the hometown uh, benefit of the doubt they gave him and then fully understanding what he was saying and how shocking that was to them. So I, I, that's my sense of it. Okay, let's, let's talk about just... Uh, process and the application. What do you think then the application would be that Luke would want us to make from this passage about Jesus, its messianic anointing? Would it be, uh, would it be that you know, we as the church and we, as Holy Spirit-empowered people, have that same mission and purpose to carry out? Yeah, I think that's a good one. <clears throat> we are carrying out what Messiah Jesus began, isn't it? He was empowered by the Spirit for international ministry, but his ministry, by and large, uh, was to Israel, wasn't it? With a few uh, a small incidents of non-Jewish people, some Samaritans, and some Gentiles, just a handful, enough to show that ultimately he cared about them, was interested in them, yeah. But we're the ones that, that are, really are internationalizing his ministry, aren't we? And we speak on his behalf, don't we? We carry on his purpose. And the same spirit who empowered him empowers us to speak forth the mighty deeds of God. Yeah, and that just sets up then the continuity of Acts that flows out of this. So this is a really important passage, isn't it? And it tells us, too, about the kinds of folks 
we want to also have in, in, in mind and in view here, not to lose sight of them, the poor, the captives, the blind, the downtrodden. And that's a huge theme in Luke's Gospel too, isn't it? Yeah, Tyler. Well, I, I, this uh, is cool application is that it, it signifies that those who are baptized in the Holy Spirit are prophet, priest, and king themselves. Well, yeah, and Luke tends to emphasize the prophetic part of that in the sense of, and that's what the Joel quote in Acts 2 does, doesn't it? In the sense of uh, not so much foretelling the future as proclaiming and heralding uh, who God is and the good news that, you know, he's delivered in Christ. Yes, so absolutely. We all God's children are prophets in that sense. All of them speak forth and prophesy. We're also a nation of priests. Holy nation, yeah, nation of priests. That's right, yes, absolutely. So it's a beautiful picture, isn't it, of the dignity of believers in Jesus and how he shared that. Remember we saw in uh, Revelation 3, verse 22, where he says, uh, uh, you know, those who uh, endure in faithfulness that I will ask them to join me in, in, in a, a rule on, you know, my throne with me. And amazing. So he has shared, shared these things. The ministry, the, the, the privilege, the purpose of this, but also the wonderful fruits and the glory of it. He, he freely shares that with us. Pretty amazing, isn't it? Now, I don't expect you to come up with all that in 15 minutes time, I understand that. Uh, but I, I hope you can see uh, when we go back to uh, thinking about the Gospels, that they're narratives, like Old Testament histories, where we need to emphasize the broader context when reading, okay? We tried to do that, at least the prior context. They demand a little bit of background information regarding history and the culture, right? The focus is on Jesus, not on us. So we want to see what the specific focus on Jesus is all about. Now, again, the more uh, richly and fully we understand that, the more powerful significance and relevance it has to us, doesn't it? It's tremendously informing to us as to who we are because we understand better who he is. But we gotta, don't, don't make it about us <laughs> early on or we'll miss seeing about who he is. See that? And the primary goal of the Gospel writers is to prove that Jesus is Messiah, not to prove that he's God. So you see that, this is messianic, isn't it? Uh, with four different Gospels, uh, you could do a comparison. Uh, this uh, account actually is a little bit later on in the synoptics, and it's clear that Luke has moved it to uh, a, a more of an of a, uh, inaugural address, a sort of a thing. And uh, lastly, the centrality of the kingdom of God. There's a picture of it, the already, not yet. He's Messiah, and he is bringing about messianic blessings, but not in the fully prophesied, expected, anticipated form. That seems to be not yet. Yeah, Eric. So if you're preaching through Luke, um, obviously as you're going through this theme of kind of, uh, especially for Luke, either like Holy Spirit or Jesus, uh, who Jesus ministered to, it's going to come up again and again. Yes. So, like, I'm wondering, and you're trying to give application in the sermon, like, what if, like, back to back, you're kind of giving the same thematic <laughs> application again and again? Yeah. That's what Luke was yeah. hammering on. Like, well, uh, it's going to be like many, many threads of a tapestry, aren't it? You, you, you want to be as specific as the passage is. Right. And so you don't want to just give a broad brush generic painting of this passage. You want to zero in on the specific point it makes. Otherwise, if you give a generic thing, then you're going to just keep giving the same generic thing all, all through Luke, aren't you? But Luke is not... He's not that repetitive. So you want to give as specific an application as you can with each of these passages in Luke that talk about this. So be as specific as the text is specific. That's a huge one. Be specific. Zero in on it. Because the applications generally are pretty, pretty pointed, aren't they? Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.